This actually isn't even the hardest part. I am not necessarily back to YouTube, but just wanted to kind of share something. Things have been tricky, to say the least. Even right now, I feel kind of nervous. It's like I haven't done this such a long time. I feel like, what am I doing? Oh God. Anyway, the point is to share about what's happening. So get into that now. The video will be long, just so you know, and I'll talk about touchy subjects. For the whole of last year, I was essentially looking for a job. I graduated in January 2019 and I had up until the 31st of December, that's when my visa is expiring, to find a job. If I get a job here, then I can stick around and continue getting my treatment and seeing a neurologist. Things didn't go as I'd hoped. I didn't get a job. The year was coming to an end and I essentially got desperate because what am I going to do? I know badge is not available in Kenya and to see a neurologist costs a lot of money. I was worried about it and I thought to myself, I think I'll apply for asylum. I don't know. I don't know what to do, but I need help. On the twenty eighth of November, twenty nineteen, I went to a police station because that's how you do it, and applied for asylum. I told them my reasons. There's no one after me. There's no one trying to kill me. My country's not in war at the moment. It's just this disease is terrible. As we all know, twenty twenty was quite challenging, but it was extra difficult for all of this, this whole me applying for asylum. Okay, so once I'd applied, I was told to wait until I get a letter of official um, summoning for an interview about this with an appropriate officer who told me for a meeting for an interview to hear more about where I applied for asylum. Before this, I still lived in an apartment that I shared with some friends and it was okay. Unfortunately, I was informed by someone else, not related to the ministry or anything, but anyway, there was an advisor of people applying for asylum and he, then he told me that I shouldn't have to move to an asylum center, I can continue living with my friends and it should be okay. But he was wrong. I had to move to an asylum center. There were just so many emotions at that time and I was really scared. So by the 5th of February, that's when I moved to an asylum center. Yes, it was scary. It was. It also wasn't as bad as I thought it would have been. But I figured I have to try this anyway. I wouldn't feel right if I'd have just gone home at the end of December and continued living like as if my disease doesn't exist as it's still very active god there's so many things happening at that time if i know that's new i have multiple sclerosis it's an autoimmune disease where the immune system mistakes like the brain and the spinal cord for the enemy and attacks them and damages the nerve coating that ends up damaging the nerves and you end up with a whole like myriad of different symptoms like blood vision, balance issues, incontinence, feeling dizzy and lightheaded and fainting. Anyway, there's so many. Let's just say any any bodily dysfunctions you can think of, that can be caused by a mess. While I was waiting for an answer, still living with my friends at the shared apartment, I saw that I should, or I can, officially apply for permission to live in a private residence, continue staying with my friends. I figured, I guess it's not that complicated, I will. I mean, I was told it would be easy, so I did. Within about two weeks or, some, or less, I got an official letter saying I'm not allowed to because you shouldn't apply and get permission for it after six months from applying. So the six month period for me would have been the 20th of May. So that happened. And then in the same letter, it also said that I'm required to go live in an asylum center. It's a requirement if I want to get any kind of healthcare or I think, yeah, if I want to be able to get health, continue getting healthcare and support, I guess. On the 5th of February, I went to live in an asylum center. If that happened, it was quite an experience. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would have been. At the same time, it wasn't easy either. I kind of was telling myself, like a friend had given me this advice that think of it like I'm just passing through this. Because as such, my life is not under any kind of threat. No one is trying to kill me. So as such, I'm not the typical as asylum case. So that would help that kind of thinking, I guess. At the same time, I had so many other issues about it because now I began to feel like, okay, well, I don't really count as a normal asylum case because I don't have these struggles. I, I'm not going through the same kinds of issues and I felt like that's kind of, been, I felt a bit invalidated. Like, am I really, like, in, I was really insecure about it because I was really wondering, is it okay? Was what I've done, is it okay that I've applied for asylum based on my illness because of my illness? In the end, I resolved in myself that, fine, there's no war in my home country, but it's like there's a terrorist group that lives inside my body and they attack me whenever the hell they feel like and there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, 
fine doctors neurologists to give me treatment tell me slow them down this terrorist group but there is no cure so you know what, what is, how do you live you know like the thing is with a mess everything is random there's no you never know what's going to happen what's going to change what new symptom you're going to get what symptom is going to be permanent what symptom is going to affect your normal daily life routines and such that is my issue and that's why i need help desperately so soon after on i think the 17th of march i was transferred to another asylum center and by the way around this time i had about a month's worth of abajo left i hadn't been asking for a refill of abajo because i was thinking to myself that technically i don't have an address anymore that's the other thing by the way i know this sounds a bit confusing because it's so many things at the same time but this is actually what it was like it was confusing it was scary it was difficult because i moved to the asylum center i had to move out from the apartment i lived in but you know how landlords are. You have certain contracts, you can't just leave when you want. And there's so many issues are happening at the same time. That I guess the hospital had recognized or realized I didn't mean ordering for a refill. My former housemates were now telling me that apparently I have a package from the hospital. And yeah, they did. They sent at least two more boxes, which is great, because that's two months worth. Before this, like while I'm at the center, I still had to talk to the nurses there and tell them about my disease, which I thought was a bit strange. The premise is for me applying for asylum is my illness. So I thought surely, the medical staff they would have been informed or something but apparently not Ugh, man it was frustrating mind you i was also told that i could have physiotherapy once they do an evaluation which never actually happened with that i kind of i just let go of it because it's honestly it becomes like something minor compared to everything else i don't have the treatment period because of how i had to move out over the apartment a good friend helped me out he let me keep my stuff at his place instead and it's where i hang out when i'm not at the center because I, I do have the permission to leave but when i say leave it means like i live there it's just that I can visit my friend. Things got serious around mid-March. I got a letter that I'm being summoned by the police. Imagine that, being summoned by the police. I've done nothing wrong, but I was kind of familiar with that. The fact that normally when your case is being rejected, it's the police that inform you and they have an interview with you to like sort of organize your departure and they really want to know what they're going to be cooperative about it or not. I don't want to get into the details of that also because honestly, it's... it's ugh. I just say it's not nice after seeing this letter i'd been informed officially that the ministry decided on my case they decided that apparently my case is manifestly unfounded i guess because i don't have the typical reasons for applying for asylum i don't get it but i really think that that kind of terminology is cruel. <laughs> manifestly unfounded i was also informed that because of how i guess i look fine i look okay it's not seen as that serious just because i'm not bedridden but this disease is serious and it's scary because at any point I could be bedridden. Like that's that's the point. Nothing is certain. It's something that I think just sucks with having this disease in general. Everyone kind of looks at you and they just assume this person is fine. So as such, you're, you're probably not that sick or it's not that serious. But it is. MS really sucks. Just a few days before this interview, that was meant to be the police. The whole country goes into lockdown. Covid finally hits Denmark and everything closes down. To be honest, when this news kind of broke out and everyone was taking COVID-19 very seriously, it came as a relief in a strange way. And I, I hate how I sound in saying that something bad happening to the whole world came as a relief to me. But why I say this is only because uh, all the meetings were cancelled and such. I have some time. And the week following, I now become, became a bit more anxious about it because now I'm thinking, do I count as a immunocompromised? compromise? Because I've heard it enough times, the people who are more susceptible to getting this virus are the ones who are... Um, I mean, immunocompromised, age is an issue, and so on. This actually isn't even the hardest part. In June, my grandfather passed away. My dad's dad. Okay, fine. He, he was about to turn 96. And that itself is a miracle. But also, it, it doesn't make it any easier. Because he seemed fine. Last I heard, either on a phone call with him, or when I've asked my parents about him, he, everything was okay. You know? That was hard. Honestly, I'm still processing everything. A week after his funeral, I get the news that my grandmother also passed away. It was difficult. Well, it's difficult. Because she was the one, she's the strong one. And in my head, she wasn't supposed to go. I guess because of all the things that were happening at the same time, I had a relapse. I believe that on the day that I was informed that must have been the day when the, that was the climax. I think it maybe began the day before or two days before because I remember both eyes hurt a lot. So let's say within within three hours, 
everything was just harder i didn't understand and in my head i just assumed that you know sometimes when you're stressed out or whatever sometimes my symptoms are exasperated so i kind of just told myself no no it's fine it's fine i'm just tired i didn't sleep properly it's fine it's fine it's fine at the same time i'm also not even thinking about this too much because i'm just thinking sure sure <laughs> So that was the climax of the relapse. My eyes, they did hurt, but they were also both blurry. The left was a lot worse than the right. This is now on a Friday. So let's say on Monday, the right was back to normal and the pain had reduced to the point. I think on the right, there was no more pain. The left, the pain had also reduced, but the vision was still terrible. It felt like if someone put like a, a gray, semi-transparent screen in front of my left eye, so it's like, but at the same time, it's obscure. Like, you know, the, the windows that you put, have in the bathroom that are semi-translucent, so people can't see you and you have privacy, blah, blah. It's like that, except it's my eye. On top of that, it was darker. So that was strange. I remember looking at the lights in the bathroom and looking directly into the light and not really seeing it, not feeling uncomfortable. And obviously, but as I'm doing that, I close the right because it's really uncomfortable, but the left just... It just looked like a, a white mark, that's all. Soon after these symptoms began, I was put on solumetral, a corticosteroid that helps to hasten up the process of having a relapse so the symptoms make them easier. The neurologist decided that apparently, because of how I'm having such an aggressive relapse and at the same time I'm still taking a Abagio, then it means Abagio is not really doing anything. And they need to move up and give me something that's a bit stronger. I was nervous about this because I was thinking about how I don't know how much time I have left so if any for talking about giving me something stronger how long will I be on it because this disease is not it's not temporary so as such when I get any kind of treatment it needs to be until further notice you don't just take it for a week or a month and it's over it's forever essentially I'm really anxious because at any point I may get a letter that says I'm going to be deported and also how I've been moved to a different center the deportation center where I've I've read apparently, you don't have the same freedoms. Like in the center I'm in at the moment, I can leave, visit my friend and go back. Whereas in these other centers, they may be closed or at least you have to check in with the police every three days or something. There's a different procedure about it. So also I was nervous about that at the same time. And it's on the different parts of the country. If this is Denmark. This is where the hospital is. The deportation centers I'm scared of are like on this side. They're really far away in the East Coast. I knew or had seen that the cases of COVID were higher in that part of the country. By August, the country was opening up again. I was nervous about at any point I'll be called for this interview and who knows what could happen next. I'd been living like day to day or like week to week and never planning beyond that. My life has really changed. So around the end of August, the medication I said the neurologist was discussing putting me on. One of them was Tysabri, I had that before, but I was positive for the JC virus, which is risky because the chance of getting PML are much higher once you're on Tysabri and you have the JC virus. The chances of having the same brain infection are less with Ocrevus, but it can cause it also. It was decided it would be Ocrevus. While we we're discussing the different treatments available, I brought up having a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, HSCT, which is where they harvest your stem cells, freeze them, you give them really aggressive chemotherapy to completely wipe out your immune system, and then they reintroduce the healthy stem cells back. So we start the immune system. As a female, before this happens, you meant to have your eggs harvested and frozen because apparently you may become infertile after all this chemotherapy. So yay, fun times. I had my emotions about that, but honestly it's fine like whatever they, i can get thank you you know so at this point i was given medication to flush out obaja from my system it wasn't so bad it could have been worse so i'm still kind of hopeful and grateful about it right now it's monday the 12th of october and on the 14th is when i'll have the first infusion of ocrevus everything is still very really complicated i don't know when i have to leave I don't know when I'll get this Ocrevus infusion. There are some things that have become permanent, like for example, I can't ride a bicycle anymore. With my left eye, it hasn't fully recovered. If I hold out my phone, like arm's length from my face, I can't read the text on it. When I bring it up close, like let's say, I don't know, like 30 cm away from my face or something. That's when I can see, but it's, it's also slow because like I said, it's darker. So I kind of have to squint to see the text better. There are so many things this experience that it's, it's really not easy to talk about. 
and the thing is it's not even over mentally i'd planned that after my last video on youtube i'd have given myself maybe until maximum august like a year by that time surely i'd know whether i got to it or well, he didn't and i talk about it but it's not over with the way 2020 has gone everything has been put up in the air all these plans nope nope whatever you want to do nope there have been good people I've met during this process, so I'm grateful for that. Unfortunately, I found out my roommate at the center is being moved on Thursday. I was bummed out about that. Her English isn't that good, but we're able to communicate and comfort each other and laugh and talk about all these experiences. And like, it's nice having someone that gets it. She also has her own difficulties with walking and her own, I wouldn't say illness, let's just say almost disability we wanted because of that too and also that she's african like from african origin so that helps too it sucks i think she's being moved to a, a deportation camp the places i was afraid that i'd be moved to i know this has been really long thank you for making it this far actually hopefully things turn out okay for anyone that's out there that also may have this disease i hope this is comforting in some way or at least if it helps you know that you're not alone yes it's hard but we try we try we stay positive somehow and it's okay to cry sometimes it's okay to go and strike <laughs> do nothing the whole day do whatever the hell you want the whole day except don't hurt other people and don't hurt yourself thank you for watching this video so far thank you for all the new subscribers as well thank you all very much We'll see you on the next one.